I want to spend just a few minutes with you in the book of Romans, chapter 1. What's up? My wife says you're going to preach it again. Amen. I'm going to be in the same book, in the same chapter, but I'm not preaching the same message. Okay. Last week, as we opened up the book of Romans, we, I, I spent much time, in fact, the entire uh, subject of my message was on servanthood. And that Paul begins the letter, Paul a servant of Christ. Then he says, an apostle, called to be an apostle. And it was brought to my attention after the service that in all of his other letters he opens up Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he leaves off the servanthood. I knew that while I was preaching. And even while I'm speaking, are you able to talk and think about two different things? Sometimes we can't. So I was preaching on servanthood, and in the back of my mind, I was debating do I need to talk about the other letters in which he does not speak of servanthood? He just says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so I was. I was doing this, you know, and uh, decided that uh, based upon the subject that I really wanted to, to get over to you, I, I didn't go there. But you have to understand that the book of Romans is anointed and directed by God just like every other book. Am I right? So, did Paul make a mistake when he did not use the word servant in the other letters? No, he did not. Uh, he proved throughout his entire life that he was a servant. So then, there must have been purpose in the Holy Spirit for him to use that word to the Romans. Correct? There must have been purpose. And if you study the history of Romans and how the, the church was... I, I, I went for months and months and months teaching on the book of Romans. And uh, those of you who went through the study, I hope remember a little bit. If, if you look at the history of Romans, the Jew and the Gentile learning to worship together. One of the most difficult aspects of of church ministry is ethnic portions of the body serving one another. You may, you may have to manipulate that a little bit. You may have to masticate that a little bit. Masticate means to chew. You need to chew on that a little bit. We need to serve one another regardless of our ethnic origins. The Bible says that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. When we come to Christ, we all come on the same footing. We come and we are all on the level with each other. And so, and I could rehearse all the ethnicities that we deal with today. I don't need to do that. You get my point. Paul dealt with those ethnic problems. Now he dealt with sin problems and sin issues for sure. For sure. In the book of Romans. But he also dealt with the ethnic issues. How the Jew and the Gentile are to get together and how they are to serve 
one another. And, and that was the whole point of my message last week, to learn uh, that we are to, to, to serve one another. It's, it's not our position in the church that's important. It's not the title we may carry, even though we'd be in the fivefold ministry, right? Uh, prophets. You know them. I don't need to rehearse them with you. You know, it, th those things are secondary when it comes to the, uh, the societal living of the church, the way we interrelate. I, I, I don't want to preach that message all over. But uh, just by way of explanation as, as to why I didn't go into uh, the introductions to the other books. I think I would... <laughs> if you didn't catch that, I'm not going to point all attention to it. <laughs> Just coming down the aisle, I thought I was going to do a marriage ceremony there. <laughs> and we can do it again if you like. By the way, is this your birthday? Yes, it is. <laughs> We celebrated yesterday, Sister Sophia's. Okay. There, there is just one or two elements that uh, I want to underscore for you today. From uh, Romans chapter 1, and we've already dealt a little bit with the introduction here, being the servant and the apostle. Uh, in verse 8 is where I want to start, if you have your, your Bibles. Uh, in, in some translations, I don't even know if this part of the scripture is there. If it's not, uh, look on with somebody else and then consider changing your translation. <laughs> After Paul's introduction, he says, first, comma, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests. If by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you, for I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now, I would not have you to be ignorant, or I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but I was led hither to, parenthetical, that I might come unto you, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks, here are the ethnic, ethnicity, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I want to speak for you, to, for just to you, for just a few moments on this issue of faith. I, I, I think if we've been in the church at least a few days, we know that there are some distinctions in faith. There is the faith that saves us. Then there is the faith that keeps us. Then there is a faith that brings our healing. There are various kinds of faith. Now they are all from one person. They all come from the Father. But they are in accordance with His will in our lives. I have taught often on faith in the, in the few years that I have been preaching. I have preached an awful lot on faith. Faith is one of those subjects, and you've probably heard me, heard me say this before, that is difficult for us to grasp. Oh, it, it's, it, it's fairly easy uh, to get a handle on an intellectual understanding of faith. We know how to spell it, and we know how to put a definition to it. But when it really comes down to living it, we stumble. How many of you have ever been in that, uh, in that position where your faith was, at, at, at the old expression, sky high? Man, you could, you could believe for the dead to be raised and healed of leprosy and blindness and, and deafness and lameness just all at one time. It all happens at once. That's where your faith is. Ever been there? Then you have also been to the place where you said, where is my faith? And I have, uh, and this is the part you probably heard me say before, it's an illustration that I use. Faith is like grabbing hold of a gnat. I don't know about in your house, but there are times of the year, I haven't figured them out yet, but there are, there are certain seasons of the year when, when we have fruit in the bowl on our dining room table and there's some kind of little bug. And it, they are so irritating and it makes me feel like my house is nasty. Man, I've got bugs flying around in the house. And you can't stop it. They're flying around, the bananas, and the apples, and all. Y'all experiencing that same thing. I don't know what those are called. Huh? Gnats. That, that's the only name I know for them, brother. There's a gnat. It, they probably have some scientific name. Scientific. <laughs> some, some scientific name to them, you, you know, with species and all that. But I have I have stood at at my uh, kitchen sink doing dishes. Oh man! Yes, thank you, ladies. I am, by the way, I am the official dishwasher of my house. Thank God we just got a new dishwasher. <laughs> but I was, I was for a long time the official dishwasher. Anyway, I'm standing at the sink and these little bugs are just flying all around. And it's not just around the fruit. Sometimes they come out of the plants. Sister Redmond has these plants in the window seals. And I'll see them sitting down in the dirt. Of the plant. Anyway, I'm, sta I'm standing at the sink and they begin to fly by and I'm watching them getting my timing down. Right? And sometimes you just have to do this and, and you're watching them until finally I spring. Like a high, 
highly tuned ninja. <laughs> I want to get out my sword and cut his wings off. Or and I'm standing there and I do that. You ever done it? And I squeeze as hard as I can. I want to kill it. Rubbing my fingers together. And I open my hand. And it's not there. <laughs> you all laughing because you've done the same thing. That's faith. Just when you think you've got it. You open your spiritual hand, and it's gone. Faith is one of those things in the Christian walk that we, it's, we come to an intellectual understanding, but a living it and walking it out is still another story. Somehow it comes and goes. I think I've got it, and where did it go? And... When I think that I have no faith at all, I don't have a goosebump. I don't have a feeling. In fact, sometimes I pray, I don't know if this is going to do any good, God, but I'm going to pray anyway. You, you, you've done that. Just when I think that I'm completely out of faith, I pray, and God answers my prayer. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Paul is writing to the Roman church, as I said, to the ethnic groups trying to deal with sin issues and ethnicity issues things of that nature. The first thing he wants to say to them after his introduction of who he is and what he is doing, King James Version says, first, I want to give God thanks for your faith. In, in modern vernacular church, your faith is spoken of around the world. Did you catch that? Now, I don't know how big Paul's world was. It probably was very small compared to our world. Right? Parts of southern Europe and Italy, Greece, over toward Iran and now Iran and Iraq. That that very small part of the world, he said, I thank God that your faith is spoken of in our world. It's even a more amazing statement when you stop to realize this was a brand new church. This, this church wasn't a split off of Ephesus. This was a brand new body. And even though they had all of these sin issues, they had the ethnicity issues, they were still known in the then known world for their faith. Not just that they had come to know Jesus, that saving faith, but that keeping faith, that kind of faith that we need to live by on a daily basis. The whole world has heard that you have that kind of faith. Now here is a very interesting thing, and you should... You, you'll know that I would be the one to notice this. The little word is. 
Do you have that in your Bibles? If you don't have the word is in your Bible, verse 8, chapter 1 of the book of Romans, you need to get a new Bible. Because I'm about to share something with you that you have no idea about. Watch this. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is. Spoken of throughout the whole world. A number of years ago, I preached an entire message. It was a minimum of 45 minutes. I, I'd like to find that tape. If, if I could get my hands on it, I would preach it again. I preached an entire message on the word in. I-N. How many of you remember that? You don't remember the message. You just remember me preaching on it. Yeah. Now I'm looking at the word is. What? Well, years, years ago, just to let you know that I'm in, I'm in cahoots with some of the big guys, at least mentally. A number of years ago, they, when they were preaching about faith, they would say it like this from another passage of Scripture. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Remember when that was a very popular message among the, the charismatics? Now, what did they underscore? Two words. Now, faith. Right? It, it, their punctuation and, and grammatical approach to that whole, sub, that whole sentence changed. Instead of, now, faith is... Now faith. Faith now. Faith now. Have faith now. Remember that? And they never looked at the word is. They just wanted to talk about the now faith. And it was a good message. It was a very important message. And I, I think it was something that the charismatic brought into the church world that we needed. A new perspective on faith. It's not a faith that's out there in some la-la land that you go look for. It's now. It's now. Now. Now faith. But Paul said to the church at home, I thank my God through Jesus Christ that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now here is the importance of that word is. When you read it in the original language, and first of all, let me, let me point out that the subject is faith. And the verb is spoken. What is spoken about? Their faith. The word is, in the original language, is in what is called the present indicative passive voice of the verb. Three terms there. Present tense. Indicative and passive. The present tense does not speak of what has happened. It does not look backward. The present tense does not speak of the future. Or something that is going to happen. The present tense speaks of what is happening contemporaneously. Now. I thank God that throughout the entire known world, your faith is at this very moment being spoken of. It's being spread through everybody 
way I know, your faith is. Now, let, I'm, I'm glad I have two grammarians in the service. Now, they, they may disagree on where commas go. Punctuation has changed over the years, hasn't it? It is, completely. Language evolves all the time. All the time. It's always changing. If you don't know that that's true, you just start texting people. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote my wife, we were talking textually on the phone, and I just learned how to do that. And she sends back these letters. Oh, yeah. and I, I wrote her back. I said, if you can't speak in complete sentences, don't text me. <laughs> Don't send me no LU2. <laughs> or L O L. No. If you love me, say I L O V E Y O U. Now, the happy faces I can handle, those are pretty cool deal. <laughs> but all, all those initials, uh, you know what I call it? You know what I call all that kind of jargon? That, that is computer ebonics. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> It's an ebonical approach to dialogue or communication via the airwaves. I better go on the story before I start waxing out. Where was I? What was I talking about? Who knows? Okay, we're talking about having two grammarians, two English teachers, and we're talking about the grammatical structure of this sentence and uh, how we're talking about how the subject faith is related to the verb spoken, is spoken. It wasn't spoken in the past. It's not talking about being spoken of in the future. It's talking about being spoken of right now. It's the present tense. Then we have the indicative mood. And then we have the passive voice. And I'm going to try to get this straight, and they will correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that it is the indicative mood that relates the verb to the subject. Now, since we're talking about Greek here, not English, maybe the, the, there's, there's a little hiccup, but... The word is, is directly related in its mood to the subject, which is faith. <laughs> Remember I spoke a moment ago about now faith? Faith is. Faith and is is related and cannot be separated. Here's the whole point, because I, I see that your eyes are starting to roll back in your head. Churches are spoken of today around the world in the same terminology. Here's what you hear about churches. Whether it's in Australia, the Hillsong Church, or it's, it's the church in Houston, the largest one in the Americas right now. I won't mention the name. That church, you need to go there. They have the greatest praise team that you'll ever hear. They have professional.
professional musicians. They have some of the most marvelous singers. These are world-class vocalists. And they are. I heard that, Carrie. They are. They are. Okay, that's that church. You need to go to this church because the pastor tells really funny stories. No, I've heard that. I, I talked to a man personally. I mean, I was personal communication with this guy. And he loved going to a certain church because the pastor told funny stories. Now, there's nothing wrong with funny stories. And you use them to illustrate and to move the subject along, you know, progress in the subject area. And that's great. So you have the church that's noted for its music and its singers and its musicians, and you have the church that's noted for its uh, funny preacher, and you have the church that's uh, very famous uh, because of the architecture of the building, and they have all the fineries and the accessories and the esoteric stuff you need to go and just experience. There's not a church that you hear of today, you've got to go there because they have great faith. See, you're all shaking your heads. You know what I'm talking about and you know that what I'm saying is true. The church is not noted for what Christ wants it to be noted for. They may have had a was faith. And they may talk about a will be faith. But you've never been invited to a faith is church. Is, is, is. Is. I'd rather be in a church where the guitars are out of tune and the voices are flat. But they have a faith that can raise the dead and shake the world than the largest, greatest church known to man. I think that when singers sing, and especially if they're going to do parts, and we work on parts, we work on parts and until if the cows ever come home, it will be during parts <laughs> rehearsals. And that's important. You need to know how to sing the lead, the tenor, the baritone, the alto, and the bass. You need all those parts. It's very important. But what if you have all the parts and they're perfectly tuned together? The phraseology is absolutely flawless. And there's no anointing. There is no moving of the Spirit. I'd rather have the anointing than the perfection of parts. Now, don't misunderstand me. Those parts are important. Like I say, we work hard on that. And we will continue to work hard on that. But when it comes time to, for the service to start, the only thing I'm interested in is the move of God. The only thing that concerns me is faith. You've heard me talk, and I'm going to close with this thought. Do you understand, you understand what I'm, I'm talking about so far? Making sense? Well, I know it's hard to follow my rabbit trail sometimes, but push all that aside. You know, I'm talking about faith is right now. 
We're talking about a church that's known not for all the finery and all the aesthetics and all the stuff. A, a church that's known for its faith. Who should I call when I need serious intercessory prayer? Call Abundant Life Worship Center. It's a church of faith. I think I may just close right here. There's one thing I cannot tell you how to do. I cannot tell you how to have faith. I can experience it. I can walk it out. But I cannot tell you how to do it. I can tell you how to do a lot of things. I can tell you how to have faith. Everything about faith is related to the author of the faith. If you want to learn how to have it, if you want to learn how to do it, then get closer to the author of it. One of the real joys I have in my counseling as a pastor, is when I come to that point and I, I can look at the counselee and say, I don't know. I don't know. The answer is not in flesh and blood. The answer is in the Spirit of God. I can't tell you the answer of that thing, but I can point you to the person who has the answer. And I can't tell you how to have faith, but I can point you to the author of that faith. There's that old expression, if you want to know it, go to the source. Faith is. Your faith is spoken of in the whole world. Wow. That's cool. As my grandson, Kevin, would say, and even Asher, that's cool. That's cool. Father, I pray right now that somehow you will take these scattered remarks, put it all together in one coherent message in the hearts and the minds of the people. May we all grow closer to you that our faith would become operational. Father, if anything is ever said of Abundant Life Worship Center, let it be said it's a church of faith. Help us all to grow individually in our faith so that we can grow corporately 
in our faith. Help us to walk it out. Not just to have a mental understanding of it. So take these words and apply it to the hearts of the hearer. It calls us to be a people of faith. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of my faith. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you folks. I